Your child's potential is limitless. Being able to socialize, have relationships, and sustain ongoing relationships is fundamental and essential. Your child might be asking you to make a bit more of a commitment, to really show them and give them that message that you are there to be close to them and that you have something in common with them. We actually see the ism, the repetitious behavior, as a doorway to expressing our warmth, our care, and our love. Whatever you do, celebrate in a way that feels good to you and is from the heart and sincere. The more you celebrate your children, the more they will look at you. Thirty years ago, our son was diagnosed as severely autistic. We had a little boy who was developing in the way our two daughters were developing. And suddenly, at about 12 to 14 months old, he started to sort of slip away. He would look at us, smile at us before that. He would hug us. He would put his arms up when you went to reach him. And suddenly you'd go to reach him and he didn't put his arms up anymore. And suddenly you would go to look at him and he would look away. And suddenly instead of playing with toys and blocks that he used to play with, he would suddenly just start to do these repetitive mo movements. The repetitive movements would be rocking back and forth. It would be flipping his fingers in front of his eyes. <laughs> he used to have this thing where he'd love to spin anything that he could get a hold of, so he'd spin plates. He could actually, sincerely, he could take a tissue box and spin it on the corner. He would go to the bathroom and constantly flush the toilet and watch the water go down. And he would go like this back and forth and make very strange sounds. It was really clear to us we had a very unusually developing little boy. When he was diagnosed as having autism and severely autistic, and we watched the dropped faces, we read all the literature, and the level of pessimism, despair, and hopelessness sort of flew in the face of our experience of him. Because when we used to see him do these things, and my folks and other people in our family would be really uncomfortable even visiting us because this boy was so strange to them. So Mark and I were really aware. He looked like he was from the planet Mars. That was really clear. And yet, there was something serene about him. There was something beautiful about him. There was actually something, in, in some way, meditative about him. So when we read all the literature, and when we saw what people were doing with children, which was basically a process called at that time behavior modification, which was reward, punishment, version conditioning, that has sort of grown into something called applied behavior analysis or ABA. We thought, wow, if I want to reach my child, that would never be the way to go. That would be the way to push our child away. So we actually originated a completely different program. And the program we originated, actually instead of forcing and pushing him to be different, we actually decided to build a bridge into his world. And we decided to cross that bridge by actually not judging his behaviors, by doing something which was considered completely outrageous at the time, which was joining his behaviors. So let me tell you what it looked like. And Samaria was the first person who ever did that. Rocking with him as he rocked. Flipping your hands when you flipped your hands. Making those strange sounds. And people around us were saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You're reinforcing this aberrant behavior. And we said, no, we're loving our child. We're trying to create a relationship with our child. We're trying to bond with our child. Actually, we're trying to understand our child. So what began with what seemed like a very, very unusual path to help our son ultimately developed into a very specific program, which we now call the Sunrise Program. People will ask us, theirs and I, you know, how did you 
come up with the specifics of what you chose to do in your program uh, with your son. And in order to answer that question, actually, we have to go back to before Ron was even born. At that time in our lives, Bears and I were learning a very special process of self-exploration. And uh, it involved uh, discovering and changing the beliefs that we had that actually were the kind of underbelly for us, for our fears, for our self-judgments, for our discomforts, and changing those into ones that would support our feeling good about ourselves and good about everything in our life. So by the time Ron was born and then ultimately uh, diagnosed with autism, we were two very different people. Uh, and it was only because of that, and only because of the changes that we made in ourselves personally, that honestly, we could even embrace or welcome this child into our lives the way we did, with um, seeing him, seeing his behavior, seeing the challenge as an opportunity for us. Uh, we didn't know an opportunity for what until later, but an opportunity nevertheless, certainly not a tragedy in our lives. And we felt that his uh, being in our lives was only going to gift us and was a gift to us. That's what we decided. We actually decided that and we decided that we were certainly hopeful about the future. Our attitude of acceptance had to be far more inviting and alluring and appealing to him than disapproval. I mean, we know that ourselves. When we're around somebody who loves us just the way we are, who thinks we're okay the way we are, we are different with that person. We open up to them more. We feel more connected to that person as versus a person who's judging us and somehow, you know, has a, has a, has a feeling about us that they're not accepting something about us. We are different with that person. It's the same with these children. They pick up on that. So that became very important. And the, the, the last thing being, it was so clear to us that this child could not find his way to our world. As a result, the only way we could in some way communicate or try to connect with him would be to go to his world. Now, you may think that's really bizarre, but think about this. We see a baby in a crib, and the baby doesn't even have to be doing anything, just laying there like a lump <laughs> in the carriage or in the crib. What do we do? We go, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, we do all of these crazy, silly, fun faces, things that we do with this child. Why? Because we're doing what we think the child's going to relate to, what the, what the child might smile at. We're, we're, and we're enjoying ourselves. We're not thinking, wait a minute, it's inappropriate to do that. No, we're finding our way and actually we know how to connect with that child. We know what to do. So this is not foreign to us. It's more we have to just expand our understanding and not close in and have a different viewpoint because this child is different than we've ever seen before not only were we able to bring Ron completely out of autism, he went from that little boy also testing functional IQ of under 30, so severely autistic, functional IQ under 30. We worked with him, those were the beginning steps, for over three years. He then emerged not only as an extroverted, loving, very affectionate little boy, he ultimately became this incredibly politically active, social, involved in debating teams, graduated high honors from high school, then graduated in biomedical ethics degree from an Ivy League university. He went on to run a learning center out on the West Coast, came back to work with us, and now the organization we founded that actually teaches the Sunrise program, the very thing that brought him from that world in which he looked very lost for quite a period of time. That very program is taught at a center that my wife and I founded called the Autism Treatment Center of America, 
We have this amazing professional staff that works with people from all different countries. I think in the last five years we've had people here from 78 different countries, thousands of moms, thousands of dads. And the most amazing thing is the CEO or the chief executive officer of the Autism Treatment Center of America, where the Sunrise Program is now taught is run by the very first Sunrise child to emerge from autism using this process. My name is Bryn Hogan. I'm the Executive Director of the Autism Treatment Center of America here in Sheffield, Massachusetts. We're going to share with you three techniques from the Sunrise Program that you can use right away to help your child. I've been working with children with special needs and their families all of my life. I have been a case manager. I've been a home health aide. I've been um, working with uh, adults with mental challenges and I've also been a teacher for children with special needs. I've had a lot of experience seeing what, what is out there. I've been here for the last 18 years and this is the most loving, respectful, effective program that I've seen. I also have two other unique connections. One is that my parents actually created the first Sunrise program for my brother Ron so I had that experience of being a sibling and going through that with my family. Also, my husband and I discovered that our own daughter had autism, and so we used this program that we'd been teaching other people to actually help our own child, and it was the greatest experience of my life. That's what's so amazing about this program. It is not just really useful and really effective, but it feels so good as a parent to do it. What we're going to give you now is a brief introduction to our program. Obviously, we can't convey all the information to you here, but enough so that you will be able to, after you're finished watching, do these three techniques with your child. And you will have a sense of what it feels like and the effectiveness of some techniques from the Sunrise Program. First, there's creating a distraction-free environment, and that's so important, both for your child, who has, is, can be distracted by so many different things that they look at, and for you to filter out the distractions for you. We're gonna teach you how to do that. Secondly, using your child's repetitious behaviors or stims to actually build a connection and a bond. Thirdly, how to prioritize and really effectively get your child to maintain and increase their ability to have eye contact with you, as that's such an important part of bonding. So we're gonna explain them to you, then we're gonna actually show you what they look like so that it'll be very simple for you to put them into practice. We really so much encourage you to do so. Enjoy. My name is William. I'm a senior teacher, senior trainer here at the Autism Treatment Center of America. I've been here for over 18 years, working with families and working with children not only here at our treatment center, but also too in their homes, not only across the United States, but also too into Europe and the Middle East. And it's been the most amazing experience to see families as they run their sunrise programs with their children and create the types of changes that they always dreamed of seeing within their children. I've also had the most magnificent and fortunate experience myself with my daughter Jade. She had autism and so me and my wife ran a program with her and after a number of years she became a fully recovered, perfectly functioning, normal little girl. She's now a young girl in school enjoying her friends, enjoying her teachers and enjoying the academic process. And so it's a real privilege to be here with you, to share with you the Sunrise Program and about getting started in the Sunrise Program. And even it's a privilege for sharing with you for those who are just looking into this as a possibility. The most fundamental and essential skill that you want your child to develop is an ability to socialize and relate with other people. 
whether with you, mom and dad, whether with their siblings, their peers, with teachers, or other people that come into their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Being able to socialize, have relationships, and sustain ongoing relationships is fundamental and essential. It's also, too, very crucial in all other areas of development. And yet one of the things we've come to understand about our children is that they can be easily overwhelmed and easily distracted by the world around them. Whether visually, audibly, smell, taste, touch, all the stimulus that falls on their senses can be really challenging and difficult for them to filter out and for them to focus. By eliminating these distractions, we're also to eliminating the competition making you the number one attraction. You also too want an environment that will help you be with your child so that you don't have to pay attention to the doorbell ringing or the phone going or somebody else wanting your attention. You're simply wanting to have your attention 100% on your child. So an environment that helps your child and an environment that helps you focus is an environment that will help your child learn and grow and develop. So let's go now and look around your house and find such a space that will help you do this. This is a great room for your distraction-free learning environment. It's like any other room or in any house across America, across the world, uh, where you have, you live, and your kids are there, you're there. And yet, as, as you look at it, yes, there's a mess here, but this can so easily be turned into a room that's going to work for you and work for your child. Now, a couple of things we can do here is to reduce the distractions even further. If you have a TV in your room, turn the TV off. Maybe you have a sound system or a computer. Turn that off also. Even unplug it from the electrical outlet on the wall. Now, as we look around here, there's some clothes, there's some toys left over. We can clear those away, making the room even more distraction-free. If there's knickknacks or ornaments on the side, clear those away, again, even simplifying the room even further. Voila! This is perfect. This perfect space, as you see, is now uh, pretty good in terms of being distraction-free. And now what you want to do is set aside just 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes just practicing applying step two, joining in child's repetitious behaviors. And step number three, focusing on their eye contact. And during that 30 minutes, just focus on enjoying yourself and enjoying your child and have fun. Also too, you want to bring in some toys or activities when you're there with your child. If you have a younger child, then bring in cuddly toys, balls, musical instruments and have a few of those available on the side for if you need them. If you have an older child, higher functioning, maybe Asperger's, Bring in some activities like board games, card games, some paper, some markers, and have those available, again, if you need them. You might have heard the term stims. We call them isms. Now, what is an ism? An ism is, and you've probably seen your child do this, it's something your child does re repetitiously, exclusively, that means they just do it for their own enjoyment, and to the exclusion of everything else. This might be things like your child flapping their hands, your child walking on their toes, making certain sounds, flipping pages in a book. It might be some children take little matchbox cars and just spin the wheels or line things up or put things in patterns. Some children who are higher functioning or who have Asperger's syndrome, they might uh, tell stories about topics that they're incredibly interested in or ask questions repeatedly, um, but mostly to themselves. It's not really so they can have a back and forth communication with someone, but it is again exclusive and repetitious and self-stimulating. We have a very unique way of dealing with that. Let's look at your standard therapeutic approach to that. That would be that these are 
behaviors that aren't okay and that we have to try and stop the child from doing them. And that's a way that we're going to get the child to be more interactive. Now, if you have a child who's diagnosed with autism or on the autism spectrum, you've tried that and it doesn't work. It can work momentarily when you take their ism toy away from them, but invariably they come back to it or they find something else and the result is not an engaged human being. Actually, oftentimes when things are taken away from children, it's not often done in the most respectful way. What we're really focusing on is creating a really engaged social relationship between you and your child or between ourselves and the child that we're working with. That's why we take a really different and I think exciting approach and that is we actually join in with these behaviors. We see the behavior as a doorway to creating a relationship. Let me describe to you now exactly what joining is. What it is, is it's doing exactly what your child is doing and doing it with them. So the first thing you want to do is actually just take a moment and look at your child. Actually observe what they're doing. Let's say your child's flipping a book. Just sit and look at them. Do they flip five pages and then stop? Do they flip the whole book and then turn it over and flip it again? Just observe so you can really see what they're doing. Then place yourself about two or three feet away. If your child has a book, you're gonna get a book. You're gonna sit there with them and you're gonna endeavor to do exactly what your child is doing. And you're gonna think of it as joining in with their game. And their game is flipping a book. So now you're gonna flip the book with them. And you're gonna think of it sort of as tandem dancing. So you're gonna look, can I synchronize my way of playing with this so that it's the same way that my child is doing it. So you're gonna flip the book and they're gonna flip the book. And you're gonna do that with them. And I would do that for at least 15 minutes. If your child's lining up blocks, you're gonna get your own blocks. You're gonna line them up. You're gonna put them your block down at the same rhythm and the same pacing as your child is putting their block down. If your child's walking in a pattern, you're gonna walk in a pattern. If your child's saying a phrase over and over again, you're gonna say that phrase. If your child has a topic that they really wanna tell you about, you're gonna become a very excited and engaged listener who's very interested in that topic and wants to hear about that topic and wants to know about that topic and is joining in with the enthusiasm over the topic. The idea is to do this really with sincerity. So this isn't about going through the motions while you're thinking about a laundry list of things you have to buy at the supermarket. This is actually using the joining as a way to connect. Think of it as this is your child's language and you are saying that you love them and that you care about them and that you want to be close to them. You're saying it in a language that they can understand. And I'd recommend that you do this for at least 15 minutes and I do it three, four, five times. Now some children, they respond immediately. Within the first two minutes, you're gonna see signs from them that they're responding to what you're doing. They might look at you, they might lean into you, they might share their items with you. Other children, they require a little more convincing. Perhaps they've had their toys taken away from them in the past. Perhaps they're not as open. And so you might find that the first time for 15 minutes, you might not see any particular way that they respond. But go back and do it again. And then go back and do it again. And show your child that you really want to be close to them. That you really want to have a relationship with them. And think of this as your way to truly love them. Our program is based on an attitude of love, acceptance, and respect. And that's why rather than trying to force a child to conform to a world that they don't understand or that doesn't make sense to them, we endeavor to go with them, to be really respectful and caring. And so what we do is we actually see the ism, the repetitious behavior, as a doorway to expressing our warmth, our care, and our love. And actually as a way to build a relationship and to build a connection. And so what we do is we actually venture to go into a child's world, to actually be with them where they are if they don't feel quite ready to be with us where we are. And through joining, we're able to build a connection. And once there is a connection, then we can really in invite a child to be engaged with us. So in effect, they show us the way in and then we show them the way. I first heard about Sunrise when I was just 13 years old and I rented the NBC movie Sunrise A Miracle of Love from my local video store. 
And it was that movie all those years ago that inspired me in the first place to want to work with children with special needs, and in particular, autistic children. Here at the Autism Treatment Center of America, I am the director of the Sunrise Intensive Program. I train the staff here to become certified Sunrise Program child facilitators and certified Sunrise Program teachers. I have worked with well over a thousand different children of different ages and different diagnoses. And I have played for thousands of thousands of beautiful hours on the playroom floor, which has been an incredible source of delight for me in my life. I feel so honored to have worked with every family that I have, and I'm excited to share with you more about the Sunrise Program so you can help your child right now. The technique I'd like to share with you is about encouraging your child to have more eye contact. Eye contact is one of the Sunrise Program's social fundamentals because it is the most important key factor when encouraging our children to have social relationships. Now the way we differ than every other training modality in this respect is we're not trying to train our children to look at us in a robotish type of way so we can check it off on a checklist as a skill acquired. We focus on eye contact during every interaction that we have with our children because we want to excite our children not only to look at us because they want something but to look at us because they enjoy and want to connect and interact with us. When our children look at us, it is a time when they will see us smiling and loving them and thus feel the warmth of what it is to truly connect with another human being. It is a time when they can feel the most close to those people who surround them and love them. The more your children look at you, the more they will learn. The more they will learn about the world of people, about how people communicate, about facial expressions, intonation, and the subtleties of communication. Most children on the autism spectrum have challenges looking at people. Even those adults and children who are considered higher functioning or have an Asperger's syndrome um, diagnosis because they have great verbal skills and academic skills. But we know and you know that that doesn't necessarily mean that they can have successful relationships with their peers. The more you encourage your children to look, the more likely they will have successful relationships with their peers. Eye contact is the deepest way to form connection and relationships, and that's why we focus so strongly on it in the Sunrise Program. So what can you do right now at home to help and encourage your children to look more? Two simple and easy techniques. The first thing to do is to position yourself so it's easy for your child to look at you. Whenever you are playing with your child, be in front of them. Be at eye level or slightly below. Be two feet away from them because we notice in our experience that when we give children a little distance, they tend to increase the amount of times that they look at us. Whenever you're offering something to your child, whether it's a piece of food, an object, a toy, a book, put it up by your eyes. Put it to the side of your eyes or right in front of your eyes. So as you offer it to your child, it gives them another opportunity to look at you. Second thing to do is to celebrate them. Celebrate them verbally every time that they look at you. And you can do this in a variety of different ways. You can give them big cheers and quiet cheers. You can whisper your cheer. You can sing your cheers. Throw your arms in the air. Jump up and down. Do a little dance. However you do it, make sure that you do it with great sincerity and from the heart. The more you cheer when your children look at you, the more they will look at you. Try these two things out right now and see the benefits of what they can do to encourage your child to look at you. Oh my goodness, that was the best look! Thank you for looking right in my eyes! Oh, I got a point on David. That was so good. You know, 
looks so great. You told my eyes. I love it. You love it. Oh. Obviously, we have many more techniques that we would love to share with you. What we're going to do now is we're going to show you clips of our trained facilitators using all of the techniques of the Sunrise program to help children grow. I hope you will find this really helpful and inspiring. Jack's five years old and was diagnosed with autism. Two of his main challenges were making eye contact and interacting with other people. In this segment, our facilitator first joins Jack in his isms of chewing and rocking on the ball. When he engages with the facilitator, she helps him to stay interactive in the game while also helping him to develop his eye contact. in the whole world. Hey, that's different. That's more like a scratch. Or did you want me to? <laughs> Pretend to eat those little toesies. Oh, you are switching it, my friend. I'm gonna move this out of the way. It's that scratch like that. Because you're switching it on me. Scratch. Scratch. So much. Jet, like that! Like that! It helps me to know what you want. Scratch. I love to scratch. Scratch. <laughs> scratch when you're looking at me. And when I scratch, 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 I love to see your eyes like you just did. Alex is seven years old and was diagnosed with autism. One of his main challenges was using clear single words. In this segment, you will see the facilitator join in his exclusive repetitious behaviors, which are rolling off the ball and climbing on the window ledge. Then, as the facilitator creates a fun interactive game, she strongly requests that Alex speak in clear single words.
Oh, oh, so you're looking at the dino. Dino, dino, deco, de oh. Dino, dino. Thank you for looking at me, dino. 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 You are a star. Go, Alex. Go, Alex. You ready? Whole word. Dino. Say it again. Dino. Oh! Dino, Dino, Dino. Dino, Dino, Dino. Dino, Dino, Dino. Randib is 16 years old and was diagnosed with high-functioning autism. One of his main challenges was the ability to participate in activities that were chosen by other people. In this segment, our facilitators join Randib in his exclusive repetitious behavior of drawing flags over and over again. At home, he would often spend hours at this activity. Now, once he becomes engaged, the facilitator enthusiastically encourages him to participate in her chosen activity. Can you, can you do it for me? I would love to do that yeah. for you. Thanks for asking. Oh, I just had an idea. We could play some football. Because yeah. I'm from the country of football. So are you. England and Brazil. We can do that. Here we go. We have the goal. Yeah. Ah, that's the goal. <laughs> I'm going to make some space. Sagat is 11 years old and was diagnosed with autism. One of his main challenges was communicating using verbal speech as he often used crying to express what he wanted. This segment begins with our facilitator joining Sagat in his repetitious activity. After the connection is made, Sagat allows the game to become even more interactive and even uses speech to communicate. Squeeze. 
squeeze. Good. Telling me. Squeeze. I like that you showed me that stuff. Now, whenever you need me to do that, I would love to help you. Oh, I would love to get that ball. Thank you for looking and telling me. All right, here comes the big th oh. I'm not sure if you told me to get it. I'll be right over here. But hey, good, tell her it comes. Oh. Nice throw. I'm going to throw it. You ready? You just tell me. Yeah, the ball. Very good. Throw ball. Throw ball. <laughs> he doesn't like throw. Good job. Throw ball. Aaron is seven years old and was diagnosed with Pervasive Developmental Disorder, or PDD. Although Aaron is highly verbal, one of his main challenges was allowing variation within a topic of conversation. He also found it challenging to answer other people's questions. Now this segment shows our facilitator joining in with Aaron's highly repetitious conversation. Aaron repeatedly asks, who's coming next? because he wants to review the list of individuals that he'll be seeing that day. Now the facilitator then asks Aaron a question, what do you eat? And then persists in a delightful way to encourage Aaron to be flexible enough to answer it. I think Cat is coming right after you. You think so? Ooh, I, let me see. Uh, mm. I think it's gonna be Cat. <gasps> Cat! Oh my it's God! It's gonna be Cat. Oh my God! I think it might be cat too. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Let's wait and find out if I'm right. Pardon? Let's wait and find out if I'm right. Well, you're right. All right, we'll find out. Okay, we'll wait. All right, that's so good. Hey, go. I think it's gonna be cat. I think it's gonna be cat too. Let me see. Hold on. Hold on. Hold. Here it comes. Who do you think is going to be at the top? Amy. And then who do you think? Oh, oh, it's going to be. Oh, oh, let me see. Linda. What? Linda. No, my parents! <laughs> your parents! Oh my gosh! Right? It could be. But you're looking at me very lovely. I don't my parents. It could be. Okay, your, your parents are. First Kat, then Amy, then my parents. Oh my gosh, you Kat, might... then Amy, then my parents. I thought yeah. it was going to be Kat, and then Amy, and then my parents, and then this person. This person is going to be skinny, tall, and have yellow hair. And who laughs when we tickle them. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Only on Thursdays. Do you think and this person eats a special food? Yes. What food do you eat? The same as me. <gasps> what do you eat? What do you eat? Hey, excuse me, are you gonna answer me? What do you eat? What do you eat, eh? You tell me, what do you eat? Hey? Let me see you. What do you eat? What do you eat? Do you have an answer? What? What? A what? Oh, oh right. Now I'm gonna have to tickle it out of you. I'm gonna have to tickle you. A what? No. No. Why? Thank you for telling me. And you're looking at me so lovely. Let me just move this a second. Hey, you haven't told me what food you eat. You must eat, you must eat tree. Uh, what? You must eat trees, yeah? You no! <laughs> you look like someone who eats trees. No! What do you eat then? Well, when are we going to see cats? Oh my gosh! Where's cat? Where is cat? Oh my gosh, cat, I see. Maybe she's out getting the food that you eat, which is grass. No! 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 no. What? You're wrong. 
Oh my gosh. Well, are you going to tell me? Because I'm getting it wrong here. What? Dad's going to come for a half hour after you leave. Maybe. She's going to come for a half hour. I hope so. And I hope Car tires. No. Well, what is it? What food do uh, you eat? I eat meat. Oh! Do you know what else I eat? No, tell me. Do you know what they have for breakfast? Um, rice? No. What? That's what I have for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we have rice and meat. What do you have for breakfast? Um, I get, as you can probably imagine, a lot of different kinds of questions about, well, what's it like to have this really different and unique past? And uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's a little strange. It's a little weird. It's a little different um, because, you know, I came from this past where I wasn't even given a shot to speak, to go to school, to live my own life. And uh, the only reason that actually I'm able to talk to you today is because my parents believed in me and they stuck by me. Nobody else stuck by me, and nobody else believed in me. And that is what made all the difference. And that is the incredible, um, that is the incredible magic and dedication that you can bring to your child. And for me, it obviously resulted in my complete recovery from autism, which I am extraordinarily grateful for. Uh, but what I find even the most amazing part is that my parents worked with me, they gave me these opportunities. I then went on to live my life. But now, as the CEO of the Autism Treatment Center of America, I get to work with this incredible team of people who are so dedicated, who love what they do, who love these kids, and love parents like you who work with them. And I get to help parents like you in the very same way that my parents helped me when I was autistic and when I was little. And for me, that, is, that just blows my circuits a little bit. It's so amazing. It is such an honor to me. And I would just want you to know as you learn these techniques and as you utilize them and you break new ground with your child that for me, it is just such an absolute pleasure and honor to be able to be a part of this journey with you. If you found what you've seen useful or you'd like to learn more, we'd love to invite you to join us for a Sunrise Program training course. And what that is, is it's three separate one-week programs. And you can do these over the course of 12 to 18 months. And what you do is you come and you learn everything that you require to really be able to help your specific child in your specific situation. The first of the three courses is called the Sunrise Startup Program. We'll talk to you about how to obviously go further with eye contact from what we've already shared. We'll talk to you about something we call the three E's, which is basically a really effective way to keep your child engaged and motivated to interact with you. We'll talk to you about what's useful to react to and what's useful not to react to. <laughs> That's also, we'll have really time to talk about all of those really challenging behaviors, everything from hitting and spitting and kicking and all of those things to children who take their clothes off and children of all kinds of unique behaviors that you might find challenging. We really have ways that we found are so effective to help with that. 
We're going to talk about joining in with your child's ism, but in much greater detail than you saw here. We'll go more in depth into the distraction-free environment. We'll talk about language. Your child has absolutely no language yet. We'll talk to you about how to get it. We'll also talk about children who maybe are incredibly able to speak. They can speak in paragraphs and long sentences. We'll talk about how to turn that into a more interactive type of communication and conversation between two people. We're going to also have time to talk about the stresses and challenges and the emotional difficulties that you might have in raising a child that's different, which can also be very unique and challenging for people. We have ways that we can, tools actually, that we can give you so when you go home that'll feel different for you. We'll help you train other people to actually do what you'll learn at the training program. We'll help you create a support team of people who can really be a part of it with you. Go to our website, there's so much you can see there. There's interviews with parents who've done the program. We have research papers you can look at. We have a message board that you can get on. It's a really educational place that you can learn a lot about the program if you would like to learn more. We would really, really like to help.